All right, welcome back. Week two of the R Lads Depth Chart Show. This is what we're known for, our depth charts. And we're going to dive into some depth chart moves from last week, this week, and what we were surprised by last week and how it affects this week's depth charts. I actually got a text message from my brother last week, who's a casual football fan. I would even say above average in terms of how serious he takes this. And he said, you know what? I had Jaden Reed on my bench. And I said, bro, that is an awful decision <laughs> on real on fantasy. And he goes, I just didn't know where he was on the depth chart. I sent him the link and I said, you're my brother. You're not allowed to say that. And it goes to show that how, I mean, we're such football nerds. We know all about Jaden Reed, but uh, if you guys are not as plugged in, you actually have a life outside of following football. Uh, our lads depth charts are the way to go for your fantasy and just, you know, uh, knowledge of the league it's the easiest cleanest way to to look at what's going on with team to team it's very easy to use at rlads.com nfl depth charts we also cover the ncaa tep charts tucker are you ready to rock man i am so ready i'm, I'm excited to, to be here again this week all right cool all right well because i was told to do this again three two one go <laughs> our first topic is going to be what were we most surprised by Week one, and I want to get your thoughts on what happened in Cincinnati. There were three teams league-wide that scored 10 points or less. The first two was very understandable and even predicted. Third team, the Cincinnati Bengals. I don't think anybody saw this coming because if you remember at this time last year, everybody was in panic mode over Joe Burrow's calf injury. He could barely move. He was moving like Kirk Cousins did this past week in week one. Those early weeks with Cincinnati last year were really rough, but now he's yeah. healthy. The drama of Jamar Chase not being there all, all summer over his contract. He did end up playing. T. Higgins is out. They lost Tyler Boyd to free agency. I mean, that had to have been – if you play Survivor, there's a good shot you got knocked out by taking Cincinnati. Was that your biggest surprise of the week? Yeah, I'd, I'd say so. I mean, that was one that, yeah, like you said, last year they started slow. I think they always – it seems like they always start pretty slow, but it's also like Burrow's kind of been hurt a lot, like coming off a major injury. So I know there's like that stuff about his wrist, like how people think that his wrist is, is bothering him. Um, so I guess it remains to be seen, but – yeah, it was definitely surprising because everyone thought the Patriots were going to be, you know, horrible. Yeah, I mean, hey, let's let's take a look at the depth chart. I'm going to put them on our screen. Uh, here's the Cincinnati depth chart, okay? And, again, using this thing should be very friendly and simple. We don't want to be overly complex here, right? And you can see this is kind of what it looked like last week. You did have Jamar Chase in there, but that T. Higgins in red, that's injury-based. And T. Higgins did not play last week. This team also lost Tyler Boyd. So now you're looking at um, – uh, you show. oh, man, I forget this guy's name. The wide receiver, Andre, number 80 from Princeton. I don't want to say it wrong and get killed, but a 2023 six-round pick, as you see there. Charlie Jones, another 2023 fourth-rounder. Trenton Irwin, who's been on and off the team, on and off the practice squad, and rookie Jermaine Burton. That's what was left – for Joe Burrow to work with. And he ends up going 5.9 yards average depth of target, fifth lowest in the NFL week one of the 32 starting quarterbacks. His career average there, by the way, is 7.9 yards, just to put it in perspective. Uh, but this is, like you said, this is a team that has struggled mightily week one early in seasons with Joe Burrow. The guy's been in the league for five years now. They are one in four. He is uh, 111 of 176, 1,038 yards passing in five games, four touchdowns, five interceptions. That is Joe Burrow week one in the NFL over his career. And I do believe, how much do you think this impacted, was impacted by Jamar Chase not being with the team all summer? Yeah, I think that's pretty big. Um, I know like if you watched, uh, if you saw like the Manning broadcast, like how upset that Peyton was with with Ayuk not being there. Yeah. Um, like, because he at least Peyton says that's like that's like huge not not having that um, all you know the entire off season. Mm -hmm. So it, it can really take a few you know a couple games um, to sort of get back into the rhythm. And then I, I think not having Higgins just kind of compounded that. Um, I think by the way, I think Andre, I think it's I think it's Yo Sivash. I that's what I was I was about to say. Yeah. I I don't like I remember in the draft uh two years ago starting with Yo Sivash. I just didn't want to, I didn't know how to finish yeah. it. All right, so good job there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so now with Cincinnati losing Boyd, having not no Higgins, 
this is a team that really had to depend on the defense side of the ball. And I'll tell you what, they did not play poorly against the New England offense. It was it was really the, the offense that dropped the ball. But there was not that much movement on the defensive side of the ball for, for the Bengals. They did lose DJ Reader, yeah. defensive tackle. And you could say they've uh, – Sheldon Rankins, who's in all caps lock. By the way, for the users, that means someone is 30-plus years old, right? Yeah. Correct. So it's kind of like a veteran for a veteran there. But the team, when DJ Reader was not on the field last year, had a bottom three run defense. And this guy, he left town. And the only way New England was really going to have a shot at A, moving the ball, but B, sustaining a lead was to be able to run the ball. And that's partially what they did. Uh, what Were there any other moves or any other holes that you noticed as you built this depth chart and maintained it throughout the offseason? Yeah, there wasn't. Reader was definitely the, the biggest one. Um, there was also uh, Awuzie, uh the cornerback, but he kind of became a more of the rotational guy at towards the end. DJ Turner sort of took over for him as a starter, uh, and then besides that, uh, they got Geno Stone at safety, um, replacing. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't know who they had last year, actually. Yeah, it wasn't Jesse Bates. That was two years ago. Mm-hmm. I think they were rotating that spot last year. They still have Jordan Battle there, who yeah, I think that might have been Battle. Yeah, there, but, yeah. I know battle battle was on the R lads all rookie team several times last year. He was okay. one of the better safeties in the NFL among rookies. Uh, Miles Murphy, the first round pick from 2023. Where is he located on this step chart? Yeah, he's down. He's on IR here. Start okay. of the year. Um, so I think he'll be back week. I assume he'll be back week five. Like, I don't think okay. it will be that long of an injury, but it was enough to put him on IR though. Okay. Um, that, I think that was a big blow because they were really excited for him coming into the year, like behind. I, I know there's a lot of tape. I, I was watching like footage of, of Hendrickson getting a lot of pressure on the quarterback, but no one else, you know, making it, making it there, hitting home. Uh, I think that's a big part of it is, is their, their edge rushers there. Like KJ Henry, they just picked up um, like, I think like last week or a few weeks ago. Um, yeah, well, how about we just go find out at the R Lads Death Chart? Right? <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. I use this thing all the time because I'm so I'm tracking these players all over, and I really want to know what weeks these guys p- got picked up. I'm actually going to dive into something like that a little bit later um, with one of the teams that have injuries that have piled up. But right there on the right side, player history, every transaction a player is involved in, you can find on the R Lads Death Chart by clicking on the name. You see on the left side the birth date, the age, the team, uh, where they were drafted, how long they've been in the NFL. And then, uh, but I think that the coolest part team history, what teams has this guy been on? But most recently, you can see in August 2024, he was waived. And then in August 2024, he was a waiver claim by, by, uh, by Cincinnati. And that those are really key elements to kind of tracking player movement and certain position groups uh, to kind of stay on top of what's happening within teams that you don't track day to day. It's a pretty simple fix. Yeah, I think he was one of the. I wish I, I want to start tracking it so we see the week, like or like the the exact date because that helps. But I'm pretty sure he was a you know final roster cut, um, and then Cincinnati claimed him. I think yep. as a, like after they put on Miles Murphy on IR and and, and et cetera. Um, yeah, I think Cedric Johnson didn't play this first. I think he was a healthy scratch. Okay. Um, and then I think uh, Tufele. They also Tufele. He was. Uh, he was one of the guys that like I wasn't sure if he'd make the team or not. Um, okay. But but then uh, Chris Jenkins is kind of dealing with with injuries, so. Cut the um, after that. Yeah. Interesting. Let's go to the New England roster because as as much of a surprise as this loss was for Cincinnati, I think it's an equal surprise for New England to win this game. And I actually want to give them some credit because I actually think there's not enough respect around the league. Uh, fans especially, with how good this defense is year to year. I mean, look at the amount of resources. If you scroll down to the defense, I mean, you just see a bunch of draft picks, early draft picks, and then free agent signings that they've invested in the side of the ball. And a lot of these guys have really panned out. Just a lot of – when you look at a side of the ball and you see a lot of day one, day two picks and free agents, uh, it it means that this team has really invested. In an offensive era of football, this team has really been on top of – the defense is out of the ball. And this year one without Bill Belichick, you know the foundation is still him. You know, this this defense still screams Bill Belichick. But th- this defense has been top eight in yards allowed each of the past three years. Since Gerard May- Mayo has been May- uh, hired, he was a linebacker coach uh, hired in 2019 after playing with the Patriots. Um, they've averaged year to year. So this is since 2019. Seventh in yards allowed per year, seventh in points allowed per year. So this has been a top 10 defense for half a decade. 
And when we look at a situation like this, the Bengals, a team that I actually picked to make the AFC, uh, to make the Super Bowl this year. Uh, and then you look at the Patriots rebuilding mode, just drafted a quarterback. The roster looks awful on paper, especially on offensive side of the ball. There's a lot of continuity on this defense side of the ball. You can see these guys that were drafted three, four, five years ago, some of them, and they're still here. That means something in the NFL. Is that something that you notice contrast in teams that always feel like they're kind of around? They're kind of making these upset victories, this continuity on the roster. Yeah, I certainly. I think I think it really helps that Mayo is still there since he was such a big, big part of their defense. Um, I was just surprised week one because they lost probably their like two of their best players on defense. They lost Judon and then they also lost Christian Barmore, which right. So it is surprising how well they did without like those two key guys, like Barmore, yeah. especially like he's kind of the leader on that D line. Yeah. So that, that was really impressive. I think, I think a was, was who is kind of taking over for him right now, mm -hmm. but I know they like farms a lot. Who's out of, out of uh, friends uh, university. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think he's, he's been really popular in the, in the preseason. Awesome. Um, but I'm he's, happy that this team, this team finds guys like <laughs> everywhere yeah. around the globe like some of these guys don't even play football i bet and they're somehow they come here and they're making you know putting together 20 30 snaps for a deep a top 10 defense year in year out i loved i love the secondary uh drafting kyle duger and uh what we got in round two in 2020 according to the depth chart 2023 first round pick christian gonzalez who started off really good last year but he got hurt and missed most of the season um and then mixed in with the veterans of of Jonathan Jones, Jabril Peppers. It's just a really well-oiled machine on the back end. And no matter what, I would say whenever you see New England on that roster, you're going to be in for a fight. Certainly. I think uh, as long as as long as long Gonzalez can stay healthy, like that's that's the huge part that happened last year is when he got right. hurt, it kind of fell off big time because he, yeah. he was such a good player early on in the year there. Yeah. Now let, let's move on to the Jets. Um, the Jets, they, they go out to San Francisco – on a Monday night, so they're traveling across the country week one after training camp. This is one of those teams that they they played the preseason scared, understandably so. You know, you start to feel some pressure both with the head coach and the front office. This team's got to win now. They really put their chips in the middle of the table. They got a mulligan after the Aaron Rodgers uh, injury week one last year. They go out, they head out to San Francisco, and I don't want to say they get crushed, but it was a double-digit loss, 32-19. Uh, to 19. I personally think San Francisco's got the best roster in football. So losing on the road week one in San Fran, that in and of itself was is nothing to be ashamed of. I mean, the, the, the Jets had this game. I circled this game when I saw the schedule come out last May, and I said, you know what, 0-1-1, whatever, just get out of this game healthy, especially after what happened last year, all that buildup, the hard knocks leading up to week one, Rodgers tears his, his Achilles first drive of the game. And uh, I'll tell you what, they showed some life early on. Yeah, for sure. I, I, I feel like it was, you know, more of a, you're just trying to get back into the swing of things. And um, I think, I mean, <laughs> I like, I like that Alan Lazard kind of, kind of had a great game after last yeah. year where he was very disappointing for them. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure part of that is, is having his guy Rogers, uh, Rogers back on the field. Yeah. I mean, the surprising thing, the one thing I would be alarmed by, with the Jets is what happened on the defensive side of the ball. They got torched. Yeah. Um, and this is a team that is built on defense. Similar to what we just talked about with New England. They allowed just under five yards per carry. Oh, and by the way, this is with Christian McCaffrey out. This was an, a second-year undrafted free agent that just ran all over this team mm -hmm. with a rookie third-round pick, Dominic Cooney, playing right guard. Uh, you know, it, they, they allowed the fifth most yards in week one to this team. And you look at this depth chart. One thing that stands out to me, I know they're not starting, but these guys were a part of the rotation. They have three undrafted rookies backing up their defensive line. And part of what makes San Francisco, for example, so good is the amount of depth. They rotate eight guys in year in, year out. They're all veterans and, and good players, in some cases very expensive players. The Jets are going bargain shopping trying to build the depth of this roster, especially on the defensive side of the ball because of what's invested on the offensive side of the ball, that's that's going to be something that we're all going to have to keep an eye on. Do you think, do you maybe foresee this team maybe adding an, a veteran at some point to the defensive line instead of relying on guys that were not even drafted this past April? 
Yeah, I could see it. I, I think the big part, it's, it's just not having Redick there. And I think I could see them doing something like that. I think that's why they kept so many undrafted. I, I know they, that they did, they did really well, like Leonard Taylor, and he was someone we had graded highly. Um, but yeah, I think not having Redick was kind of huge because he was going to be like that top, clear, clear top guy. And then the rest of the guys, rest of them behind them, Jermaine Johnson and then Clemens and McDonald can kind of rotate in. Yeah. Um, like having Tech McKinley, I, I don't think is, he's not great. So yeah. <laughs> it's just it's kind like of different a, patchwork. You know? Let's start. A lot of people don't know who Tack McKinley is. I would say some of our younger fans, but I mean, he had one of the most dramatic uh, draft weekend yeah. reactions, <laughs> if you remember back. But this is a guy, he's been in the league a long time. You could, again, you look at this profile. He's gonna. He's he's still young though. He's gonna turn 29 if I'm doing my math right this November. Look at the amount of teams he's been on. So this guy's been in the league since 2017. He's been on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine teams already. Mm-hmm. Um, you see IR. You see COVID. Uh, you see practice, practice squads, squad. activations. You know, um, it, it's. If you're relying on this guy, there's nothing wrong with taking a shot. But I would want a serious hedge behind him someone yeah. that hey this guy's probably not going to work out if you are uh, you know analytics have taken over the league and analytics a lot are based on past previous history and, and what has happened in the league trends right the trend is going to tell you tack mckinley will not work on what is your hedge you know will mcdonald's has not shown much of it being a first round pick in 2023 other than the occasional preseason highlight but if these guys are not pr- good enough depth a you're going to have a hard time rotating at all. B, if injuries, I should even say when injuries start to pop up, who's going in? Now all of a sudden you lose that strength that the defense have. Last thing on the Jets, have you heard why Sauce Gardner was taken out of the game the other night? Was there an in, Were you looking into any possible injuries or what? I, I don't know why. I saw that he went out briefly. Like, I mean, yeah. maybe it was like one of the, um, you know, one of the observed, like the uh, third party observers, like it might have had him come out or something. I'm not sure, mm-hmm. but. Um, yeah, I don't, th- I think he's practicing, so I don't know if it's a, like, I don't know if it's a major concern going forward or anything, yeah. but that, that was kind of questionable, especially when it was like, it was very critical drive going on. Like it yeah. was like for the half or something. Yeah, I don't was, remember. Yeah. 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 I have a couple of jazz connections and I haven't gotten, I mean, I'm not really being intrusive about it either, but I haven't gotten, haven't heard anything about what happened there. They're asking me if I know anything about what happened to Gardner. Um, not people within the organization. I should not say that, but more uh fans of the team or you know friends of friends types and they Mm -hmm. i have no information on what happened there all right well you know before we kind of start talking about some injuries around the league and and what that's going to do to the jet charts you know i don't want to go through if you guys want to check out the our lads all rookie team you could head over to our uh there's probably a video right below this actually there are two videos below uh the our lads all rookie team i post those every week um there was a rookie of the week from the rams on the defensive side of the ball jared verse the offensive rookie of the week was also from Los Angeles, but in the AFC from the Chargers, that is right tackle Joe Alt. If you guys want to hear more about those guys, head over there, watch that video, read the article. You could scroll down on the website. I think, yep, week one, we're all rookie team. I have a write-up on, on both the players in there, but on if you keep going, you'll see the rest of the all rookie team. And there's like a little explanation of why these guys uh, made the all rookie team. And this is something that we do every single week for the entire year. And that really gives us a foundation for how to make an NFL all rookie team uh, in January. Uh, were there rookies that you feel like, man, I wish we saw a bit more because there's two glaring ones in my eyes. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, the ones I was going to highlight, I mean, I feel like, um, but what, can we go through yours first? Yeah. The actual team. Yeah. Or, or, or the guys that I want to the see guys, more of? The guys you want. Yeah. Yeah. I want to see more from Caleb, uh, Caleb Williams. Yeah. Our QB2, by the way, Jaden Daniels is our QB1 last year in our the R Lads draft guide, the oldest one in the business. I don't want to say that Caleb played bad, but you can tell that if he was kept in structure, if he was kept in the pocket, there was there was not a natural field in there. And that's the thing that we saw in college on his USC tape that when he was really forced to kill teams from the pocket. It, that it's just not a specialty. He's not elite in that area. Now he is elite when he's off schedule, when he's kind of creating on his own, but you can find ways to contain that. I mean, we saw that with Mike Vick in Atlanta. I mean, he was so good when he was off schedule and under pressure, but 
when you force him and, and there's ways that defenses can do this to kind of stay in the pocket and pick you apart from there, he struggled. And that's what prevented him from really reaching his ceiling. So Caleb Williams, it's way too early to go down that path of saying how good he is. But that's one thing I noticed. And I want to see a little bit more, especially with the amount that they've invested into that offense around him. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I think that he'll get more comfortable, hopefully, uh, with the, the you know speed of the game and everything. And it's just the first week. Um, but I know, I mean, he he's had a ton of hype coming in here, though. So and, and I feel like when Jaden Daniels had a much better performance in kind of a, a blowout game yeah. um that it's a little little upsetting but i think that you know it's it's really early so yeah last one and then we'll move on to the injuries marvin harrison one catch mm -hmm. i think five or six yards from the arizona cardinals i mean there's even some rumors out there that he's not he, he clocked very slowly at his yep. top miles per hour which is pretty easily tracked now and i went down my own rabbit hole last night and i have game notes on him i actually wrote notes about him in my preseason top 32 from last year saying I never really saw him get over the top on a consistent basis over college coverage. Um, I'm not going to call him slow and that's his game is not explosion, but I did think, you know, this is where if you want to be glass half empty, he did not work out at the combine. He did not work out at his pro day based on history in, in this business that always tells me that they are hiding something. Now you get miles per hour metrics from the program itself and a couple other analytic companies and they say on the field, he was moving fast, but you know what? I go down the path of, you know, is that spun, you know, incorrectly by the school, you know, is, does he actually run a four five, five? I mean, to me, I think he's still an elite receiver, but that can affect your draft rate. If, if he did, if he went to the combine and ran in the high four fives, I think that's, that can give a lot of, a lot of reason for pause. And, and I'm a guy that says, Hey, go watch the tape. That's all you need to watch. Right. But it's uh, it was not the ideal start for Marvin Harrison, who maybe did have one little concern over his head after how he handled that pre-draft process. I, I hope we see a little bit more from him next this week. For sure. And I, I'm, I'm wondering how much of it was like was Kyler and that, that offense, yep. like, how much of it was in his control, you know, it's kind of hard to tell, especially just having the one week. Um, but that's something people are going to be watching really closely, especially yeah. just because all their rookie receivers had such a great, great first game. I mean, Odunze got hurt, but other guys like neighbors, Brian Thomas, um, uh, Lab McConkey, they all had really good first yeah. games, I think. Yeah. I mean, Hey, remember I, I, as fast as the NFL goes, it's a marathon. You, you don't want to, you don't want to be the guy making strong statements after one week, not even after two weeks. And a lot of NFL receivers over history, they don't shine right away. It's not a, it's not just a, an apples for apples comparison where you're playing college versus NFL. There's it's such a much more complex system and has a lot more to do with talent and ability um, with, with how defense how complex defenses are. I mean, who, for all we know, maybe they really Buffalo really made an effort to, you know, bracket him, double team him and, and really mm -hmm. shut Kyler out from even looking his way. Let's dive into some of the more notable injuries. The most obvious one is at, in Green Bay. Uh, we The Packers, well, at first we said Jordan Love will be out several weeks, but now Matt LaFleur, head coach, is saying, we'll see about this <laughs> this upcoming Sunday. I'd be shocked. That would be, that'd be surprising. <laughs> it probably would be a silly decision, too. You know, if mm -hmm. you're at the end of December and you're a game out of the playoffs, you go for it, but – that knee injury, there was a buckle there. And yeah. it. I was actually surprised it wasn't a more serious injury than what came out. But they made one of the most interesting acquisitions, personnel moves in the entire NFL preseason. And that was trading for Malik Willis, who is now likely going to be the starter for at least a week. Malik Willis, you remember this kid coming out of Liberty? Yeah, yeah. He was, I mean, he was seen as like i mean it was crazy draft day you know just the yeah. slide that happened and his stock yep. kind of plummeted from there yep as you can see right there the 86th overall pick and there were even the week leading up to the draft there were some credible voices that were saying he might go round one to detroit yeah like <laughs> that, top I mean, it's he he had the talent to be that high but he never played good quarterback at liberty he was just like an unbelievable arm strength a thick body broke a lot of tackles unbelievably fast but man that 2022 quarterback class kenny pickett desmond ritter malik mm -hmm. willis matt corral bailey zapp sam howell and then also this brock whole Purdy. class was saved by brock purdy yeah <laughs> 
but Which you know, is, Willis is funny being Mr. Irrelevant. That's that's yeah, uh, yeah. perfect. I mean, it was that, and our lads' claim to fame is in our seven round mock draft that is in the draft guide. So we're not lying about this. Brock Purdy was Mr. Irrelevant to San Francisco in that seven round mock draft that takes us hours to do um, <laughs> in the in the weeks leading up to the draft. I mean, this kid has had three starts, and as you can see, he was with De- uh, Tennessee, and yeah. he had three starts when Ryan Tannehill went down there in 2022. Uh, you know, 50% completion pressure. Uh, comp- uh, sorry, completion percentage, zero touchdowns, three interceptions, a 42.8 pass rating. I mean. When I was watching him in 2022, this is where I started to say, this is Tim Tebow reincarnated, a guy that is really fun to watch, and he's got physical talent, but he's not a quarterback. Uh, but one thing I will say, and I, this is, if there's, Matt LaFleur is one of a few names in the NFL that I would trust to get something out of him, at least create a game plan that can really hide his weaknesses and exemplify his strengths. This year in preseason, he was 20 of 27, 205 yards, two touchdowns, one interception, 105 quarterback rating, 101 rushing yards on 11 carries. I'm not going to overreact to that because he's playing against backups most likely, but he did get better year one to year two, year two to year three in preseason football. So there, there's something worth watching here. Absolutely. Yeah. It wasn't surprising that he was didn't make – uh, the Titans or they traded him away because they brought in, it's a whole new kind of regime there. Yep. Um, I think has Carthon been there for a year now. Yeah. He, he, he really... started, he started. Yeah. Because Robinson got fired. So this mm-hmm. is his second year as GM, but he's also with his second head coach now. Yeah. So it's an all new regime and they brought in Mason Rudolph. So it was pretty, mm-hmm. the writing was on the wall there for, for Levis. Yep. Um, but the thing that made me raise an eyebrow was that it was green Bay that got yeah. him. Um, like you said, if, Matt LaFleur, I feel like with his game planning, I think that he'll get something out of him. So yeah. I'm really intrigued to see how well it goes, especially because Willis has only been there for a couple weeks. So, uh, yeah, that that's a really interesting one for sure. Yeah, it's just an interesting team. I really am impressed by Green Bay. And here's my philosophy on backup quarterbacks. I want a good athlete at backup quarterback because 99 times out of a hundred, when your starting quarterback goes down, you're screwed. I mean, that's just the truth. So you're going to have to either heavily rely on a defense slash running game or some weird plays by a backup quarterback. That's not very good, but he's an athlete and mm-hmm. he can, he can make circus acts. He can make things, he can create on his own. Um, he might hurt you as much as he helps you, but I like having an athlete. Tennessee, for example, as you can see on their depth chart, their starting quarterback is a 2023 second rounder. This guy's a second year player. He hasn't even started a full season worth of games yet. You still, you don't know what this kid is yet. Mm -hmm. So Mason Rudolph makes more sense from a backup quarterback perspective, because if, if Levis simply just bottomed out and didn't work out, at least you have someone that has engineered an NFL offense for multiple starts over his career. And that's what Mason Rudolph brings where Malik Willis you know, this team, they probably just lost hope in him and said, hey, this is not a guy that's going to be able to carry our team from a veteran perspective if, if Levis were to go down or he bottoms out. So I could see why the trade was made from both sides. Yeah, and like you like you were mentioning with the having like a super athletic backup quarterback, I think that's big for like say in game, your, you know, your starter goes down. I think yep. that the other defense, you know, they took all week preparing for that starter. Having okay. somebody come in who's just completely – opposite in play style i think that's kind of like it's always interesting like joe flacco is anthony richardson's backup it's like right. complete opposite uh, player <laughs> yeah, but that's good point. when you have an uh, offense when you have like Stike in there i feel like th- they have you know they have it all planned out if yep. richardson goes down they'll just you know transition the whole offense sort of S- same similar with when flacco was in baltimore yeah. Lamar jackson yep that's a good point now the 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 other huge injury of week one uh, in, was in Carolina, and they lost defensive tackle Derek Brown for the season. Um, as you wrote, a team extremely devoid of talent. They just lost their best player on defense. Uh, I mean that that what what did they do to? I don't even want to use the term replace. Mm-hmm. It, it, you can't replace Derek Brown. You're going to have to replace his roster spot. Do you know which one of those moves? Uh, up there was the, the, the roster move that kind of came in and replaced him. Yeah. So, I mean, 
I think it was uh, I think it was PV. Yeah, they signed him off the practice squad, but I don't I don't know if he'll actually you know start. It, I think right. it'll be more um, since this is just sort of the base uh, defense. I feel like it'll probably just be more Tuttle and Sean Robinson, and then Nick Thurman will play a little bit more. So Tuttle yeah. will probably move, but um, yeah, it's it's not it does not look good because it's already a very especially the interior D line is very, very weak, like probably the weakest part of their roster too. And uh, not having Derek Brown is massive. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is a rough, rough roster and they got absolutely blown out 47 to 10, the biggest blowout in week one in Carolina. I mean, nothing seems attractive on this team, to be honest with you. I mean, this defense, think about this. Okay. This team finished last in the NFL in 2023 in sacks and pressure rate. That's with Brian Burns, by the way. All right. Brown, Derek Brown, who they just lost, led the team in pressures last year. Okay. Here are the next few guys in team pressures last year and where they are now. Brian Burns, he's in New York, traded. Frankie Louvu, linebacker, signed with Washington. Defensive tackle, Deshaun Williams, signed with Cincinnati. Outside linebacker, Marquise Haynes, signed with Arizona. Justin Houston left and signed with Miami so that now that Brown is out from the worst pass rush in the NFL last year, their top seven pass rushers from that team are gone. This team had four pressures last week against the saints. I know they made a couple of free agent acquisitions in Jadavian Clowney, who I think was more of a product of the system. Ashawn Robinson. I've watched a lot of him over the past couple of years. He's He's a re- very replaceable, just another guy. Jag is what we call them, right? Mm-hmm. This team is going to get torched for the rest of the year. I, I don't know if they're going to win a game unless Bryce Young rises to the occasion. And year two is going to be big for him. Doesn't have a ton of support. But, I mean, this team is scary bad. Yeah. It's, I, I mean, it's it's a new whole new uh, regime again. And, then you know, it's a new offense. It's just it was not a – not a good first outing for, for Bryce Young. I mean, I think it, it could be one of those, you know, ir, irreparable type of, you know, he looks kind of scared out there, you know, like not this no poise. And especially when you when the score keeps racking up, you know, against you, it's just like spirals. Yep. And I, 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 I even just watching Brad, I mean, he has very little support offensive line. I think they were the worst offensive line of football in week one i believe don't quote me on that i just remember going through some of the numbers they were they were out there they were one of the worst offensive lines in football week one i mean this i remember having so many second thoughts on putting a high grade on bryce young and i'm not going to peg this on him but he doesn't even look competitive right now and part of it was that size factor man like it there are not quarterbacks at that size that play in the nfl they're just not i mean and and he doesn't really have a special, unique talent to make up for. He's slippery, and you know we called him a gamer. A lot of Alabama, he came up big in big moments. But I do wonder. I hate to sound like that Monday morning quarterback, but sometimes I wish you know you really truly go with your gut rather than look at the helmet, look at the highlights, look at the national spotlight, and be like, hey, that's that's a guy because he really. It, he looks like Seneca Wallace right now. Same, like that's the only quarterback in my database that I had that measured in anything near that was Seneca Wallace, and that's kind of what he looks like right now when he's playing football. Uh, sticking, sticking with the NFC South, Tampa Bay. Whew, I mean, th- this team, them, them and the Rams, which we'll get to eventually, might be the most banged up team in the NFL. Uh, especially on one side of the ball uh, after week one. See, I mean, I'm just going to read some of your notes that you sent. Mm-hmm. But you know what? How about you? How about you give me what you wrote about these guys, and then we can kind of just dive into some of the analysis. Sure. Yeah. So the big one was Winfield has got, got hurt, which he hasn't yeah. placed. He wasn't placed on IR, but I did read that he would miss the next couple of weeks at least. Okay. And then the, the other thing is, yeah, on one side of the ball is, I mean, they they lost Logan Hall. I think didn't play. Or, or can't see one of them got hurt during the game and one of them was yeah. out before it. Um, and then their secondary is what was the big one besides Winfield is, is that which Winfield is like Winfield and Lamonte David and Vita Vey are like the three kind of top guys there. And yeah. the secondary is pretty lacking besides. Um, and I think Zion McCollum got hurt, who was starting for them. Um, the other was 
where is he at? Bryce Hall, who's out for the year. He was like, he kind of, they kind of brought him in to be like the number three or number four guy next to Josh Hayes. And then Josh Hayes also got hurt. So I know they put in uh, Christian Izian. Uh, I don't know how to say his name, but yep. they put him in as a, as like an outside corner during the game because it became yep. so like, I don't like Keenan Isaac. They just signed back again because he was a free agent. And then Tyreek Funderburk was a, uh, was inactive. So like they didn't have anybody active besides Jamel Dean. Yeah. So they had to play their their nickel uh, safety guy there at outside corner. Yeah, those are not familiar names. And this is a team that also traded away Carlton Davis this past yeah. season to, by the way, Detroit, who they are playing this week. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, this team is going to go to Detroit, one of the top three passing games in the NFL last year on the road, and they're going to have Jamel Dean at corner and a bunch of undrafted free agents from the past two years. Now, Izeen was a solid nickel last year. He's not an outside guy. He was on the R Labs all rookie team multiple times, an undrafted free agent. But still, I mean, if you're going to have that and also miss a couple of your pass rushers, this this could be really ugly, really quick. I mean, I was even watching Baker Mayfield talk about the game, and it's he won't say it. He shouldn't. And he's the leader of the team, but he says, "Hey, this is going to be a good learning game for us." You know, it's we you probably have zero shot at winning this game, but it's going to be important for them to see. You know, how can they fight? How can they finagle to make it a game in the second half? I mean, that's probably going to be the goal for this team. I know they're going to say they want to win, but if this is a game in the second half, especially in the fourth quarter, I'd be surprised. Yeah, it could easily be similar to sort of their game they had against Washington, where like yeah. Washington is sort of just trying to, to get score points, you know, because they're just being scored on every single drive, you know. Right. Yeah. Um, so like Washington's offense didn't look that terrible later on because they're just, you know, throwing it all over the place. But, uh, yeah, it's more concerning. I feel like it could just be, you know, this sort of like a blowout in terms of the the defense. I'm really yeah. concerned with that for Tampa. Yeah. Moving on to the Bears, you know, we, we circle back to this Caleb Williams talk and like, hey, we want to see him play a little bit better. But his fellow top 10 rookie, Washington, who, my, who is my personal wide receiver two in the last draft, I had him slightly above Malik Neighbors. Um, he was hurt. And the rumor is he's going to be out several weeks. What else are you looking at at that wide receiver group? Yeah, that that the worry is, I mean, like, so when they got Odunze, it's like, oh, they they probably have the best, you know, three receivers next to next to the Texans, I'd say. Yep. Um, but not having Odunze is pretty massive because the other receivers they have are DeAndre Carter and and then uh, Velas Jones, who I have a, as a running back right now, and he's not he's not really a receiver. He can't catch the ball. But um, those two guys are both just return guys. Yeah. yeah. Um, they moved Velas Jones to turning back just to get something out of him. And then uh, Tyler Scott, who I think was inactive that first week. Mm-hmm. So uh, I, I'd imagine they'd bring somebody up like Ture, Ture or, or Colin Johnson or something. Colin mm-hmm. Johnson would be fun to see if he gets a shot uh, here. But yeah, they still have Keenan and DJ Moore. And I'm sure they'll probably play more 12 personnel with, with Gerald Everett. Komet, yeah. like, didn't, Komet didn't have too much usage that first game. So I could see right. him playing a lot more. Yeah, they're definitely going to have to get a little bit more creative with personnel packages. But Tyler Scott, just to give a little color on him, this is a second-year, fourth-round pick. Um, He was drafted for his potential to be a vertical threat. And, again, if you guys ever want to kind of read up on a player real quick, you can scroll down and and kind of read what we had on him coming out of college, some background information, some workout information, and then, more importantly, a scouting report. What can he do? What can he not do? Uh, but this is a guy, by the way, he went seven catches, 116 yards this year preseason. He did produce. Uh, he was non-factor last year as a rookie. But I do want to say in my scouting report, I'll just read it here. You don't have to highlight it, uh, Tucker. But this is something that I wrote somewhere in that report. It says, Scott needs to strengthen his hand catching and smooth out the inconsistencies to his game. But he will immediately become one of the more explosive threats in the league. I don't normally say stuff like that in scouting reports unless I really do believe it. Uh, it's a very easy cliche to think, he, oh, he's going to be one of the best in the league. He's going to be one of the best at that in the league. You know, there, there's some analysts out there that will say that about, you know, 340 guys. It's just like they just, it naturally just rolls off their tongue mm-hmm. and kind of lose some credibility. I mean, uh, Troy Aikman does this a lot, right, where he just, oh, one of the best in the league, one of the best in the league. I'm like, didn't we just hear that? Scott, to me, I saw something on tape with him that I do think th- there is a Will Fulber caliber deep threat in this kid if he can, again, smooth out the con- inconsistencies that he has with his hands. He's not a big physical guy, but 
this is – if Adunze is out for a week or two, this is a guy to watch because I do think there's something here. Yeah, it seems like he would be probably be a better fit to kind of fill that that role there. Yeah. Um, but it, it'll be interesting to see, like, sort of how they, how, how much usage he gets um, compared to the other guys. Because sometimes it, sometimes it looks like that, that'll happen, and then it's just, oh, he played, like, 5% of snaps. You know, it's, like, just really interesting to see how the team, man, like, ends up – you know, doing it because there's stuff that they'll see, like something that they do that that's just not good at the pro level. Like it, if, if it's blocking or if it's, you know, whatever it is, catching the ball. Um, and that's like kind of a, a, a doesn't let them, you know, succeed. It doesn't let it. They can't be played really. So, right. That'll be who, who do the Bears play this week? The Bears game. have Tennessee. Oh, no, sorry. That was last week. The Bears have. Let's see. I got my schedule right here. Um, the Bears are no. Oh, this is a great game. They're on the road in Houston Sunday night. Ah, oh, gotcha. National TV game. That's going to be a fun game to watch. Yeah, uh, huge, huge opportunity for you, Tyler Scott. That could this could be your coming out party. Mm-hmm. No better time to do it than on, on national TV in Houston against an up and rising team. Uh, all eyes are going to be on that game. You you get two big young quarterbacks like that. A lot of people are going to be watching. CJ Stroud yeah. and, and Caleb. So we got three teams left here, guys. We'll we'll try to speed this up a little bit. Cleveland Browns, tell us what happened to the Cleveland Browns, Tucker. Again, on the defensive side of the ball, this is another team that they're already dealing with offensive issues. You, again, this is a very quick thing. Look at all that red on the offensive side of the ball. What happened on the defensive side of the ball here? Yeah, so you'll see the defense isn't red at all, but it's because the guys are all on IR, which is not, not great. And they actually had – they already had four placed on there yesterday with Juan Thornhill, who was a starting safety Maurice Hurst, who's kind of their number three uh, defensive tackle that they rotate in, uh, Muhammad Diabate and Tony Fields, uh, okay. more special teams guys. And then today they placed Miles Harden on there, um, who was kind of their backup, like nickel. And yeah, that's just like they had to bring up several guys from their practice squad. Mike Ford, uh, Khalid Hudson, they signed from uh, the, the Saints practice squad. Yep. Um, Sam Kamara, they brought up from their practice squad. A 270 pound uh, defensive tackle from Stony Brook. That's <laughs> that, yeah. sounds, that sounds like a, a New England Patriots type move. And I mean, hey, if, if you're going to be depending on this guy, I think you're going to be in some trouble. Yeah, he played. He plays like he was more of a defensive end, but yeah. in the preseason here with the Browns, he's been playing interior. So okay. that's where I'm listing him right now. I, I don't, you know, I just figure they're bringing him up. It's got to be that spot because you know they only have three other guys there. And, Jefferson, makes, they don't really want as a starter. They kind of want him as a sort of role player. It does make sense from the regard. I mean, this team's going to Jacksonville this week. That Maurice Hurst, the the reason he's still in the league is he's just he's an interior penetrator. He's not an every down player. He's not a run stuffer, but he can penetrate. And I, I bet if they have a package for Kamara to get five to ten snaps in a game, that's going to be the role. A guy like that at that size, and you can't put that guy on the field for a long time. But if you have specific pass rush situations, I bet we see him on the field. For sure, and and I think they have a couple. They brought in they got the uh, let's see, uh, Siaki Aki, Siaki Ika. They brought back because okay. they caught him. They caught him. They brought him back That'd to the practice boy. squad, so he could be because he could be someone they promote because he knows you know the system after yep. being there. Yep. Um, but uh, Jawan Briggs, an undrafted guy, is the only other interior defensive lineman they have. So yeah, we'll we'll see we'll see what happens there. But I, I bet Quentin Jeff- Quentin Jefferson will probably play more snaps. Um, yep. I, I'd imagine in this game. Uh, but yeah, the other thing is their their offensive line and and Njoku also hurt. Like the first, that was a major issue with their first game. Besides Watson being terrible, was that Jedrick Wills and Jack Conklin both missed the game, um, and and then I think I think either Hudson or Dewan Jones also got hurt. So they went down to like their fourth and fifth offensive tackles for that game. So okay, the, the injury is a huge thing for for them to watch. They have yeah, and they really need this defense to be star because their offense looks terrible too. I think one of the worst five offs five offenses in the NFL right now. Uh, moving on to the Rams, man. I mean, the Rams, you know, I know we talked about a couple of teams that really lost a lot on defense. The team, the offense that I think I am most worried about right now is the Rams. And it's what happened both in this game and before this game. I know they're getting a guy back next week, but tell me what happened to this Rams depth chart. And and I'll get, I'll give some feedback on what, just a couple little notes on, on some of these guys that we're going to bring up. Sure. So, yeah, I know today, right now, uh, the only guy who is their projected starter on the O line that's practicing is Jonah Jackson right now at left guard. Yeah. Um, because Kevin Dotson or Havenstein are both hurt still. I, they're hoping Havenstein will come back for this game. Yeah. 
I know um, he's limited, but, yeah. But otherwise, uh, there, there are two left tackles, the first and second. Um, Alaric Jackson is suspended for one more game. And then, uh, and then who's the other? Joe Nopum got, uh, got hurt and placed on IR. Um, so now they're down to Warren McClendon, who came in for Havenstein uh, last game. Um, right now I have McClendon moving over, and they might. And if Havenstein plays, then I would imagine it'd be – I don't know if – I don't think they'll have John Christian. I, don't, I guess they might play him because of how poorly uh, A.J. R. Curry played yeah. in the first game. But then again, they literally just signed Christian yesterday, so I, I don't know. Um, but he did play. He did, he was like a spot starter last year for uh, Tennessee. Yeah, Tennessee yeah. last year he played a little bit at left tackle. Yeah, um, and then the other the other guys. Uh, so Bross will probably play right guard again. Mm-hmm. Bo Limmer is going to be their their center, who's a sixth round pick. Do you got anything on him? Yeah, I mean I scouted him last year. Really good athlete. A really good athletic tester. Um, he was a one-year starter at center, and I think he play, He was another year starter at guard. Um, his report should be in there. Powerful yeah, player, guy. Player right guard before uh, shifting yep. center. Yep. Powerful guy. Um, I can even see on, in the, on the field against Detroit week one, um, he always gets good initial contact, but the secondary rush moves that some of these D tackles move, he's just not quick enough. He's not reactionary enough. He's athletic enough. But again, you could tell me you test here athletically, especially for offensive line. But if you don't forecast and you don't react well and you can't stay balanced when you do have to react, it's it's going to be a tough a tough road for these guys. And we haven't even brought up Puka Nakua not not being there. I mean, such a huge part of that offense. I mean, but just stick with that offensive line because I do think it's going to be the determining factor for this team early on. McClendon at left tackle is what I think will happen. But this guy is a career right tackle. I just want to be yeah. clear with that. He's played very little left tackle over his entire career, both last year as a rookie and his college career. I mean, this, the amount of snaps he's seen in live game matches under 100 yeah. over his college and NFL career. Yeah, that's that's certainly going to be one to watch. I mean, they'll really want having signed back just because of how, how, how weak they are at depth there. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, not having Puka, I mean, I think – is is not ideal, but they kind of showed last year they can sort of you know guys will come up. Tyler yeah. Johnson had a great had a great I game, know. and as long as yeah. Cup is still there, I think they'll they'll be all right. But yeah. it's more the O line and keeping Stafford upright. Yeah, just throwing the ball twenty times again, and it'll it'll work <laughs> out. Which I'm happy. I'm a fantasy. I'm a Cooper Cup fantasy owner. So yeah, I mean, I would say if you guys are watching this, you're not a fan of the Rams. If you want to relate this to your football team, and I know not every football team is the same, not every depth chart is the same, mm-hmm. but left tackle, just go and go to your favorite team's depth chart. And just look at the names and take away the left tackle, the, the backup left tackle, take away the center, take away the right guard, the starting right guard, and the starting right tackle, and tell me how your offensive line would look. Because that's what the Rams are staring in the face right now. And that's, again, that's why I love the setup of the Arlaz depth charts. It's really easy to just kind of see, you know, what is behind these guys. A lot of, a lot of people don't know what, what is behind a team. So, um, and again, you can go back and you could scroll back to look at what this offensive line looked like uh, back on September 2nd. And yeah, just, it is just a week ago or, or so. It's like, no boom, no boom's gone. Uh, a a different team. Gone. These two <laughs> are both hurt as well. So it's, it's a different team. It really is. Yeah. All right. Well, last team here, uh, we're, we'll go with the Indianapolis Colts. What happened in the defensive backfield in Indianapolis? Yeah. So the main, they already lost, uh, at become, uh, like for, most of the year um Mm -hmm. before the season which which while was was concerning it was also like probably their their deepest position group at at edge so i wasn't like too upset about it um but this is a much bigger one losing juju brents i think at at cornerback because that's such a unproven and and weak group outside of kenny moore who's just a slot he's their slot guy right Uh, the outside corner is is really weak so they have jalen johnson starting again uh, who was a seventh round pick last year. And then Dallas Flowers, who uh, he, he had been a starter before, but he sort of lost the job uh, to Jalen Jones here this off season. Um, he was an inactive, a healthy inactive last week, but I would imagine that he would start over uh, Samuel Womack because Womack was just brought in uh, from roster cuts. Uh, he was claimed off of uh, 49ers. Mm, interesting. Now, this team has tried to, fill their depth chart and that kind of circle is back to what we talked about with the jets using these undrafted free agents to back up their defensive line and how vulnerable this makes they've they've whiffed on draft picks in the secondary 
when it comes to depth. I remember Darius Rush was a fifth round pick last year. They cut him. Yeah. They cut, I think, two of their draft picks this year. Jalen Simpson, who's still in the practice squad, he's converting from undersized safety to maybe too slow at corner. I mean, this is where I think drafting on day three, you can tell a difference between the really good teams that are there year after year because every team's going to fight injuries. Sometimes you'll see teams get lucky here and there, but that's why the drafts are so important. I think the best news for this Colts team right now is that they're playing against the quarterback Malik Willis in Green yeah. Bay. I mean, that's, I mean, thank God for them that they're not playing against Jordan Love because even if they are very vulnerable on the backside, you're, you're probably going to be okay. Even if Malik Willis has a quote, good game, it's not going to torch you the way a real established quarterback would. Yeah. And you can just look at the the Texans game. I mean, I feel like they, they can, they'll definitely be able to compete when it's not someone like love there. Like right. they, they were, they were blow for blow with, with Stroud last week. So I think that, I think that they, they could have a good shot, especially if Downs comes back this week. Yeah. And whenever I heat, whenever I see a team that has like a really weak position group and they don't have the depth, I kind of like, all right, where did this team put their resources? And as you can see on the depth chart, the defensive front, I mean, one thing I love about the Colts, I always overpick them. <laughs> I always think they're going to mm -hmm. be better than they are because I believe in their philosophy of stacking the defensive line with talent. I mean, Layatu Latu, our edge one in last year's draft is a backup to Quiddy Pay, another guy I liked. Yep. But yeah, he was our highest graded defensive end uh, in last year's draft. And he he's going to... Between him and Quiddy Pay, you see, like Quiddy Pay, a first round pick. Grover Stewart and DeForest Buckner, established veterans that got paid. Taekwon Lewis, a second round pick. Uh, on behind them, they have a, a, a Deo, uh, the kid from Vanderbilt, a second, Dingo, second yeah. round pick. Adabore, who I loved at a Northwestern, a fourth round pick. Raycron Davis, a solid starting off defensive lineman from Miami um, on the depth chart. This team has a lot of talent up front. So that is where you want to be if your secondary is banged up. Certainly, I, and I just right. I think it'll be a big big thing it, it was, is how the the secondary the, the corners shake out, and then as well as safety was like the big concern they had over the off season. They have yeah. Blackman, but then besides that, Nick Cross and Ronnie Thomas, they're yeah. not super. I know they were trying to grab some veteran safeties like yep. Justin Simmons, but that never came to fruition. Got it. All right, my man. Well, that, that's going to wrap it up for the week two depth chart show. We are 0 for 2 on keeping this at a half hour. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, when there's a lot to talk about, we talk about it if we're not on a tight schedule. But right now I'm being um, yelled at right now because my four-year-old just pooped it in the toilet and he needs someone to come clean him up. So that's going to be the end. That's going to be the end. It's a good timing. <laughs> that's, that's the cue. This was the last team uh, that we were going to talk about today. Uh, we hope you guys enjoy week two. Again, look at the depth charts if you're unsure about certain fantasy decisions. We got your back on that. And. Uh, if there's any extra analysis you need, check me out at our lads underscore Cy on Twitter. Um, I'll do it everything I can to kind of keep you posted on all these moves that Tucker is doing uh, for the depth chart. But uh, Tucker, thanks again for this week, my man. Keep it up. You're doing awesome. Thank you. Have a, have a great week, guys. See you guys.